I, I like the title myself uh, because I believe it's indicating the controversy that we are going to have within the next several weeks and months. It's quite obvious that too many have believed that we could continue to be on drugs, that we could continue to be on monetary and fiscal stimulation, and uh, the forecasts in financial markets for a long time were clearly that um, the exit can be postponed. The exit from stimulus must be postponed. And um, the, the most problematic figure in this game, of course, is the man with the beard, Ben Bernanke. <laughs> it's not my job to talk about this particular part. We've got the right man for that job, Otmar Ising. And you will certainly listen to him with much more attention because he still is, in a sense, in charge, whereas I'm just an observer. So that's my agenda. Uh, I will discuss with, you, discuss with you about the sequence of exit from monetary stimulation. And we will have to look into the arguments and the sequence of decisions to be made. We will talk about the phasing out of fiscal stimulation. And there will be some interesting facets, some interesting nuances. But basically, it's obvious. We cannot have fiscal stimulation forever because of the high debt and the high deficit of quite a, a number of countries. Uh, and some people only discuss Ireland and Greece and Portugal. That's astonishing. I will just let you know about some of the numbers. It is very important that we address Japan and the United States in this context. And then we will move into the implications of um, the underlying performance of certain countries, plus the changes in policies, and find out what it implies for the development of uh, the world at large. And my headline is divergence. Yesterday, I got a phone call by a Chinese journalist. He is preparing the visit of his president to the United States. And he was talking just about bilateral balances between the United States and China. And I said, sir, it's the wrong focus. Help your president to understand that. You have got an eternal surplus with the United States. And don't try to overcome it. But you, the Chinese, will have an eternal current account deficit with Latin America. You don't produce enough soy. You don't produce enough meat to feed your people. End of story. You will have a current account deficit with Latin America. And for sure, you will have a current account deficit with those places that deliver energy to you. And you badly need energy. So tell these lovely Americans that they should have their surplus with somebody else, but not with China. You have very good reason to educate the Americans that a better model for solving issues is multilateral approach. So the, the most important word is divergence. We have to manage divergence in a meaningful way, hopefully in an optimal way. Exit from stimulus. Take the question mark away. It's done. We have to do it. The old world has been for too long at zero interest rates, or close to zero interest rates. But look at the new world. The new world has started to move away from very low interest rates, but at a snail's pace. 
with very inappropriate speed. This will be speeded up, and it will be speeded up soon. Uh, being in Zurich, being in Switzerland, of course, I'm trying to find out what will the Swiss National Bank potentially do. <sighs> I just mentioned it a second ago in the interview. The right solution, of course, would be to join the euro. <laughs> That's the only meaningful option. But nobody entertains the idea. And therefore, there is no option for Switzerland. Whatever you do, it's wrong. You either kill one sector or the other. So you make up your mind. Whether you want to kill the hotels and the restaurants and the manufacturing sector by having an exchange rate that is ridiculous, or whether you want to pursue policies that at the end of the day make life very difficult for the financial sector. Okay. No, I have no solution for Switzerland, with the exception of joining the euro. But uh, again, I'm, 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 absolutely, I'm absolutely assured the city of London wouldn't like it. Wall Street wouldn't like it. Blocher wouldn't like it. <laughs> and I would not know about the European Central Bank either. Okay. As to the fiscal policies. First of all, while at the beginning the 2009 fiscal stimulation was meant to be for 2009 and max for 2010, it turns out that still some fiscal stimulus out of the packages decided then, back then, are still not spent. And where are the places where the fiscal stimulus that is still left is rather big. This is in those countries where fiscal authorities are organized in a complex way, where democratic processes are particularly complicated. And therefore, it takes almost eternity before a plan is being executed. I don't speak about cantons because I can speak about Lenda, the German Lenda. We have a federal structure that helps us to whatever we do to delay it ad infinitum. At this moment, in the middle of January of 2011, I'm standing in front of you. My beloved German politicians have spent not even 40% of the planned stimulus spending so far. So 60% are left. But take it for granted, they never will spend the 100%. Because there will be enough objections of citizens, not only in Stuttgart, that stand in the way of it. We have enough obstacles that stand in the way of even doing what is being planned and decided. We are incapable of execution. I don't really object to this reality because I have fallen in love with democracy. Democracy is too good a thing to be squandered against economic efficiency. Economic efficiency is wonderful, but it's not the most important thing. It comes secondary. So while I would be happy if we could be a bit more effective, as for example the Chinese are, I would not, I would not really suggest that we copy China. China has done the fiscal stimulation in the most effective way. They have had the biggest fiscal stimulation of any and they've executed fast. Others have had considerable packages, the United States, for example. They've spent a lot, but still, there's something to be spent. Germany, as I mentioned, is quite behind, and there will be, therefore, further stimulation, even if not planned like that, 
in 2011. As to fiscal policy in the emerging countries. Emerging countries, I would even go a bit further than my bullet shows, emerging countries are mostly overheated. They are no, not close to overheating, they are in an overheated situation. And therefore, the departure from fiscal stimulation is badly needed in order to avoid imbalances, new bubbles, and this time, different from last time, inflation. We are in a situation where inflation rates in the emerging parts of the world are already in danger zone. We are beyond 5%. Beyond 5% is danger zone even for emerging countries. And central banks and fiscal authorities who are not serious about that are creating more trouble, and they will act. The one country that has moved a lot is Australia. But China is hesitant. India is hesitant. Brazil, of course, we don't know because we had just the change, the political, the political changeover from Lula uh, to Dilma Rousseff. There are other groups of countries where fiscal restriction is a fact, not because of an overheated economy, but because of something else, the sovereign debt crisis. The sovereign debt crisis is an issue for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's not just one explanation. The fiscal difficulties in some countries are almost exclusively a fallout from the banking crisis, Ireland. Ireland is a very different case from the other cases. I would bet on Ireland's economic future. I do bet on Ireland's economic future. They've just got crazy bankers. That's it. They have a, a reasonably young, increasing, dynamic labor force. They are sitting in the middle of a vibrant world, and they can offer a lot of quality services to the rest of the world. And they will be back up and running if they get this damned banking stuff behind them. Spain, a very different case. There, the ballooning was the real estate sector and was construction. Um, I do have some experience in correcting real estate and construction sector. Uh, I can tell you it takes years to get this rebalanced. We Germans had our own crazy construction bonanza after unification and immigration into our place in 95. It took us 10 years to correct the construction sector to reasonable levels. It will take the, Spains, the Spaniards 10 years to correct this bubble. They will be suffering from subpar growth for a decade. There is nothing you can do about that. You just have to prepare for that. And I hope everybody is prepared. The Cajas, the government, and I know they are not. And therefore, that's a difficult part. There are quite a few others who have current account, who have, who have fiscal deficits and now have to correct. But they have mismanaged almost everything. They've had a corrupt public sector, Greece, to extend Portugal. And it's very obvious that they now understood fiscal restriction is of the essence, that's the only alternative they have, and they do it. I would welcome if capital markets do a intense, a meaningful study about the intensity and the political support for this restriction in those places. The world would be a better place if the financial markets would pay attention to what the Greek do. San Papandreou is almost the exact opposite to Father Papandreou. And if social democrats in other parts of Europe 
would study what their social democratic prime minister in Greece does. They could learn a lot for themselves. I strongly advise social democratic leaders of Western Europe to study Papandreou for what he has done in order to learn from them and him. Okay, that's the, the third group. The fourth group is there are these bubble countries that have not yet seen the red card from the capital markets. But they, out of precaution, already pursue restrictive policies. And I mentioned Spain, I mentioned the UK, I mentioned Italy. I start with Italy. Italy almost has escaped the attention of everybody, politicians and markets alike. Tremonti, the finance minister, has pursued policies over the last one and a half years that are mind-boggling. They are very un-Italian, and the world doesn't realize. Tremonti understood that Italy is in for deep trouble, and he doesn't want to get out of office without having solved it. And he has done a good job, and he does a good job, and there is fiscal restriction in Italy, something that I consider necessary for several more years. I have no idea about an alternative prime minister to Berlusconi. Sorry for that. But uh, an economist has been trained to not think along the lines, what do I dream of or want? But the most important question for an economist is, what is the alternative? Ladies, gentlemen, what is the alternative to Berlusconi? OK, so much for this group of countries. As you can see from my last bullet, whereas I'm quite convinced about and have some views on the countries that I've mentioned, I'm quite open with respect to the countries that are, at this moment in time, considered to be in a situation that they could continue fiscal stimulation. These are the countries that have current account surpluses. So how about the countries of current account surpluses, like Switzerland, uh, like uh, China, like Germany, Norway, are they in for continued fiscal stimulation in order to help the others who badly need to restrict to be in an overall situation that is less recessionary? I, do fully, I fully understand the argument. And then the question is, should a country like Germany pursue fiscal fiscally aggressive policies in 2010 and 2011 and 2012? And the answer is simply no. Why? The current account surplus of a country like Germany is something that naturally will unwind. Why? Because we are a country with a rapidly aging society, with a shrinking labor force, that's already a fact, and an aging labor force. And in only a few years' time, the post-war baby boom will completely leave the labor force, and a very small cohort of young, and even a smaller cohort of educated people will enter the labor force. And we have a lot of guys rich pensioners who want to eat and shop around, but nobody to produce. That's the natural condition for a massive current account deficit. So we will help the world with a current account deficit in five years' time and in 10 years' time for sure. But please, not now. The only I would allow, I would allow for fiscal stimulation in Germany for now if the Americans and the Indians guarantee us that they finance our old age pensioners in 10 years' time. Then we could agree we do the job of stimulating the economy through fiscal stimulation now. 
So much for that. I have tried to explain that to Joe Stieglitz, who always argues we should pursue more fiscal expansion. I've explained it to Joe Stieglitz. I know that he understands what I talk about, but he doesn't admit. Okay. These are the numbers that result from it. We have a high debt, we have a high current account, uh, we have a high deficit, and it's very obvious who is who. The debt ratio of the old world is what worries. Our debt is as high as our GDP. And the developing country's debt to GDP is just one third of it. And the deficit ratio has about the same differentiation. So the indebtedness is the problem of the old world, not of the dynamic new world. Now, in more detail, same relationships. Germany, the debt, not terribly high. The deficit, quite low in 2010. France, unfortunately, not in as good a situation. But look at the UK. The UK, for so long, praising itself as being out of trouble. Their deficit well above 10% of GDP. And that's something that I believe uh, is not fully understood. The, the government of Tony Blair and of Gordon Brown have led the UK into a very difficult situation. And now, with the need to reduce, to cut back in the financial sector, this country will be in for a considerable period of retrenchment. Greece, we already have discussed. Spain, we have discussed. Spain, Spain's debt to GDP is still relatively low, but the deficit ratio indicates that Spain is in for trouble. But Japan, Japan is really in bad shape. And I would, I would even prefer to advise Russia over advising Japan, because I don't know what answer to give. Old age poverty for the Japanese is a guaranteed. <coughs> My biggest worry is that the world doesn't understand in which situation the United States is. The United States is heading towards a debt to GDP ratio of 100%, and its deficit is double digit. And it seems as if the Americans don't understand that this is not sustainable. So now for the implications. Moderate growth, moderate inflation, boom. On the left hand side, you can see what are the GDP numbers and the inflation numbers. And it seems as if the headline is warranted. I begin to worry about inflation. And I do begin to worry about inflation, particularly as a consequence of the implications of emerging countries' growth and commodity prices increases. And I do not see anybody who is willing to allow its currency to appreciate with the exception of a few, like the Swiss, and therefore your inflation rate certainly will be controlled. So on average, there seems to be not much of a problem for 2010 and 2011. And the divergence of development that I just described, strong growth in the developing world, strong growth in the emerging parts of the world, slower growth in the mature part of the world, and some reacceleration of growth in Germany, whereas at the periphery of Europe, growth will be smaller. Now people argue as if this would be the end of the world. In the Euro area, we have now countries with high growth, like Germany, almost 4%, and others continuing to have a recession. Most people argue as if this would be a problem. This is not the problem. This is part of the solution. There was excessive growth in Spain for 15 years. There was excessive growth for 15 and more years in Ireland. 
And now they redress that as a consequence of market development plus policy. That's a rebalancing. It should be considered a welcome rebalancing. The question is, will this uh, differentiation continue? And that's, that's more difficult. That's more difficult. I would suggest that the emerging world continues to emerge. For now, for next year, not only for 2011, for 2012 as well, and most probably even thereafter. The old world redresses the excesses in a number of cases, in a very bold way, in other cases, only in a very timid one. And the US probably has not yet understood. And old Germany, does it come back? Will it continue to have above average growth for Europe? Uh, I guess for 2011, yes. 2012, I'm a bit shy to already claim what the result will be. So when many of the things are moving in the right direction, why worry? Why, why such a debate about currency war? Why even a debate about trade war? With Europe, we have an interesting concentration of views, not only in financial markets, but in politics as well, on the euro area, which doesn't help us a lot, because we have quite a number of countries outside the euro area that are interesting cases. We have Hungary, for that matter, or we have the United Kingdom, two countries that allowed themselves to use the exchange rate in a rather aggressive way to help themselves out of trouble. And what is the result? Despite a free exchange rate, they are in deep recession. Despite a floating exchange rate, they don't feel the freedom to pursue policies of monetary accommodation they pursue policies of fiscal restraint instead. And Viktor Orban even dares to really pursue tax policies that are against the spirit of the acquis communautaire. Very interesting. I just wanted to indicate that this simple, simple debate about the euro is an unacceptable constraint under difficult circumstances obviously is not good enough an argument. It doesn't fit, because otherwise you couldn't explain Hungary and you couldn't explain the UK. <laughs> the US and Japan, both, are anything but out of the doldrums. I do suggest that um, the relatively good growth rates in Japan in 2010 were probably on the high side and had to do with the inventory cycle of the world economy and had to do with uh, the very strong performance of their neighbors in Asia. But if you look into um, the latest numbers in Japan, it is quite troublesome. And Japan is a troublesome country, not only because of the macro circumstances, but uh, because of the political circumstances as well. Uh, they have change of government and change of direction, and they have no sense of direction in the political arena. Uh, Japan, no more, is in good shape, politically and economically. About the US, I'm less certain, uh, because the economic data are quite mixed. And some of the economic data indicate that probably the United States, even under adverse circumstances, is doing relatively well. So I would not count out the United States. Uh, however, I do suggest that probably 
part of the momentum in the US has to do with unsustainable fiscal and monetary policy, and therefore should not be taken for granted for 2012. I'm pretty sure 2011 will not be the year when the chicken comes home to roost. If it comes home to roost, it is 2012 rather than 2011. For now, I'm pretty sure uh, it is the emerging world that provides us the economic momentum for not just themselves, but for the global economy. And the very fact that the emerging world now is no more a small part of the world, but is a heavy weight, implies that they have an important bearing on global markets, commodity markets. And the commodity markets are reflecting exactly this strength. We are close to $100 per barrel of oil. It may be only a few days, a few cold days in February, and we got $200 per barrel. Or a next leakage of some pipeline in some place. So we are, we are in a situation where the old world still struggles economically, whereas commodity prices are already very high and agricultural prices are particularly high. Since we are here in the middle of Europe, it's very obvious that we not only look to Latin America and look to Asia, where the economies are humming,